Hello dear Formula One fans and MSM friends, it's the Japanese Grand Prix and as you can see, the first driver change for the race weekend in Suzuka has already taken place. Unfortunately on our side and not somewhere with one of the teams. All the chassis are still there at the moment, we'll talk about that later. But unfortunately our Christian had a small accident during the move, found lots of treasures from the Shumi era. Unfortunately, he took the wrong year as an example, namely 1,999, and suffered a broken leg. So here's a speedy recovery and best wishes to our Christian. Feel free to add your thoughts in the comments. And now we'll take a look at what happened today in Japan on Media Day. Among other things, it was about the driver market. And Flo will tell you what's new there right now. Yes, the driver market. Today it was once again about a familiar name, namely Sebastian Vettel. His name has come up a lot recently in relation to Mercedes, especially when I don't think many people believe that anything will actually happen. However, he does have one supporter in the team, at least for now. Lewis Hamilton commented on this today and said that he would love it if Seb came back, not only because he thinks a lot of Sebastian Vettel in sporting terms, but also because he believes that Vettel represents the right values for Mercedes, you can interpret that to mean that a few other drivers don't. Hamilton also said that there are some drivers who are more selfish than others and that some don't have the right integrity and the right values to be able to drive at Mercedes or to survive there. I'll leave it to your interpretation as to who that might be. One thing is certain though, Hamilton would love it if Seb came back. Seb has once again commented on this in a few interviews, but again, somewhat vaguely. On the BBC, he said that these thoughts were going through his mind, but he didn't want to say anything concrete about it yet. And elsewhere on Sky Sports, he said that it depends on the package he is offered. So one thing is clear, Sebastian Vettel doesn't want to switch to a latecomer team, and at Mercedes they don't know whether a cockpit will become available. In that case, he might be much more likely to go to the WEC. He recently tested there with Porsche and there could even be a cockpit available for this year, at least at Le Mans. But Vettel wasn't the only big driver name to be discussed on Thursday. It was also about Max Verstappen and the rumors that have been circulating in recent weeks that he could leave Red Bull. Why? Yes, we know there is quite a power struggle within the racing team of the energy drink brand. Does this mean Verstappen could actually leave the team? That is the big question. He himself didn't really want to know anything about it today. He said he is happy with his position and even emphasized that he actually wants to fulfill his contract. The only question is whether the other people he has tied himself to in the team, such as Dr. Helmut Marko or Jos Verstappen, can remain in their positions or whether there will be some changes. Another driver who also doesn't believe that Verstappen will leave his team is Fernando Alonso. He would also be an option for Red Bull somewhere if the world champion were to leave. Alonso said he sees zero chance of that happening. Before that, he said that if Verstappen leaves Red Bull, it might have an influence on his choice of cockpit. But as I said, he doesn't really see any reason why that should happen. The Red Bull is the best car. It probably will be next year as well. And also, Verstappen probably won't find a team with which he can beat Red Bull so quickly, be it Aston Martin or, especially in the current situation, Mercedes. So much for the driver market and the developments that have taken place here in Suzuka. Now let's look at what actually interests us all the most and what has perhaps been neglected a little in recent times, namely the sport. And for the first time since Singapore, there was a winner other than Red Bull. For the second time in the last year and a quarter, it wasn't Red Bull that won with Max Verstappen or at least with Sergio Perez. That means, of course, that people have now looked back and said, why did Verstappen actually retire? And Verstappen has revealed something interesting, that he can also explain and shed some light on his anger after the retirement in Australia, because he said that the team had already noticed on Saturday in Australia that something wasn't quite right, but they couldn't find the problem. They couldn't say that was the reason. That means, of course, afterwards you can simply say why they didn't just change the brakes. Afterwards, you knew what the problem was. 
not at the time. That's why he was perhaps a little more upset than he already was when he retired so early. But what's important for him now is that it was a one-off incident and they found out what the problem was. And from his point of view, the whole thing shouldn't happen again here. That's why he has no worries from a reliability point of view. And also from a performance point of view, he says the whole thing wasn't like Singapore last year, where they were simply slow and bad compared to the other competitors, but they were fast in Australia. And that should now be repeated in Suzuka. Red Bull were incredibly strong there last year. Verstappen did well, was six tenths faster in qualifying and had a full pit stop advantage in the race. In other words, things are looking good for Red Bull. The RB20 likes fast corners and there are quite a few of them at Suzuka. On the other hand, we now have Ferrari as the first pursuer, Carlos Sainz as the winner. After the operation, he's now getting there, but he's also stepping on the euphoria brakes a bit and says that we won't be able to challenge Red Bull straight away or always drive against them and win. Ferrari want to get closer, but they just have to see how it looks in Suzuka with the fast corners. In Australia, the graining on the front axle was a bit of a problem. Here it is more limiting due to tire wear, which means we'll see how it goes here. Charles Leclerc is also interested in simply seeing what the gap is like on a track like this on Red Bull. He doesn't assume that they're going to drive around his ears either. And Sainz adds another one. They have a very small change to the rear end, but apart from that, the updates will only come later in the season. And he clearly states that they will be needed if we want to compete for victories. And they are Ferrari. Of course, that's the goal. They definitely want that. And We'll just have to wait and see how things go for Red Bull and Ferrari this weekend. But what is already certain is that there will be no presents. You can get Motorsport Magazine, our wonderful print edition, and best of all, you can also give it as a present. Easter is already over, Christmas is still some time away, but who knows, maybe there will be a birthday, a wedding anniversary, a Tuesday. All valid reasons to give a subscription as a gift, and you can do this at abo.motorsportmagazine.com and you can secure it for yourself or give it to your friends. And now let's take a look at what else was so exciting in Suzuka and here comes Flo again. Yes, but in Suzuka it was or still is about Australia, namely the well-known action on the penultimate lap, George Russell's accident and Fernando Alonso's previous driving behavior. Opinions are still somewhat divided as to whether the penalty was justified or not. George Russell was, of course, of the opinion that there had to be a penalty in any case simply because of the role model function. He felt that if it had not been punished, it would have opened up a can of worms for other drivers. I would say that it would have opened the door for drivers to carry out similar actions this year, which can sometimes be very dangerous. Russell himself also explained why he reacted so shocked to the accident namely that he briefly looked at his steering wheel beforehand because he had to make some changes there. He did this on every lap of the race and he could not have assumed that Fernando Alonso would suddenly slow down so early. That also played its part in the accident and he said that it was no excuse that Alonso just wanted to take the corner differently according to the motto slow in fast out because he first slowed down then accelerated again and then slowed down again. According to him, that made no sense, and George Russell had another very important argument to make. He said that it is a very bad example for many young drivers who could then follow such an action. We often see in the junior categories that very borderline actions often happen there. You don't need to add another factor to that. Alonso, of course, saw things a little differently. He said that if there hadn't been the accident, Nobody would have talked about it and there would never have been a penalty and above all, nothing would have happened on many other circuits, for example, Abu Dhabi. They would have simply driven through the runoff zone and then Russell could have attacked again on the next lap. That's why he didn't understand the penalty. Others were of the same opinion. Lando Norris, for example, said that it wasn't a brake test, so why should there be a penalty? Lance Stroll described it as ridiculous. Valtteri Bottas and Guan Yu Zhou were also on Alonso's side. However, drivers such as Charles Leclerc and Sergio Perez did not see it that way, as they both felt that the penalty was completely justified. However, they questioned the current concept of penalties a little. Perez doubted 
whether this rule should now be interpreted in the same way for every race or whether this inconsistency, which unfortunately happens far too often, should not come into play again. And Leclerc said that time penalties in general are not a particularly good concept. We've had this topic many times before, I don't want to revisit it now. Between Russell and Alonso, by the way, there's no dispute, no bad blood. They both said it was nothing personal, and when the helmet is on, you just have a slightly different mindset. Incidentally, they have already met in the meantime, namely in a cafe in Monaco. And there Russell said, yes, the only thing that bothered him a bit was that Alonso didn't pay for his coffee. He could have used that as an excuse. Of course, the whole thing was meant with a bit of tongue in cheek, but it has to be said that there was another aspect to the whole accident that was much discussed today, namely safety. Russell said from the cockpit that it had taken an extremely long time for the VSC, the virtual safety car, to finally come out. We did the math and it was 11 seconds between Russell's impact and the virtual safety car phase. Russell said that was too long because in a race it's quite possible that five to seven cars will pass him, especially at the start, and then someone would certainly hit him. In this case, of course, it was a bit different. Stroll was more than 10 seconds behind and the safety car phase came out just as he was about to pass the wreck. So there wasn't really much risk there. But Russell said that something had to be changed for the future. His idea would be to introduce automatic detection, i.e. AI, so to speak, which automatically calls a virtual safety car phase at a certain point when a car comes to a stop, preferably within less than a second. He did not explain whether this is technically possible and how it would work without causing errors. But it is definitely an interesting idea to avoid potentially unpleasant accidents. Meanwhile, Lance Stroll criticized the fact that it could have been red and not just a VSC phase. However, it has to be said that it hardly made a difference in this particular situation. Because it was the last lap, you would always be under this there is this minimum delta time that you have to exceed, i.e. where you have to slow down. And there is a minimum delta time for both a VSC and a safety car, as long as it is not yet on the track, or even when there is a red flag because the drivers all have to drive past the scene of the accident again. In this respect, it makes no difference. But safety was also an issue at the corner itself because we had a similar accident last year when Alex Albon hit the wall and was thrown back onto the track. Now the same happened with Russell. A lot of drivers wanted to see changes. Russell was one of them, Albon and also Alonso, who said that the angle at which the wall is positioned is not ideal. Of course, there are other solutions, asphalt, runoff areas and so on, but I don't think we all necessarily want to see them. As I mentioned at the beginning, being prepared for all eventualities is always a good thing. That's probably what Williams is thinking after what happened in Australia. The good news for you, and especially for Williams and Logan Sargent, is that Williams will line up in Japan with two cars and two drivers, at least for the time being. The bad news is that the spare part situation at Williams remains precarious. This means that the replacement chassis that they would have liked to have last time and for the next races will not be available anytime soon. That won't come until the first US race of the year in Miami. Hopefully, the team believes. Things are even worse for Logan Sargent because while Alex Albon is relatively cool about the whole thing, he said he was allowed to drive the last race either way and says, hey, this is not a new situation for us. We've known since the start of the season that we don't have a spare chassis. If something happens, then we're out or something else has to happen. Logan Sargent sees it differently because although he takes it easy and doesn't hold a grudge, the next piece of bad news came straight afterwards because he doesn't get his intact chassis back, which Alex Albon dusted off last time. Instead, he gets the repaired Albon chassis that had the crash. The team says, hey, no problem, it's no big deal, it's just 100 grams a bit heavier, but that's not much, it shouldn't be a disadvantage. Why is the whole thing, you might be asking yourselves now, do they want to put him at a bit of a disadvantage again to give Albon the better one? No, it's not quite like that because the team says that they wanted to avoid the effort of having to rebuild the whole thing again. In addition, there is of course a potential for error with a rebuild and they wanted to prevent that because Albon only got the chassis of course, 
but all the other components in the car were his, his power units, his gearbox, his parts. Accordingly, they said they were not going to do that again. He'll keep this one car, the other one has to be rebuilt with the repaired chassis anyway. And so it should continue like this. And Williams is of course hoping that nothing happens again because if something happens again, the same scenario would happen. Immediately game over for the respective driver or in the worst case perhaps again for Logan Sargent. Well, mended chassis, mended bones, that means we say once again, get well soon to our Christian. And if you are now saying to yourselves, hey, reporting all day on motorsport, um, Formula One, MotoGP, DTM, Formula E, maybe that would be something for you too. Then how about simply applying to us, not just as a super sub to fill in quickly, but full time every day here in our studio and office in Graz, maybe even as an internship before, during, after your studies for at least six months, just have a look at jobs.motorsportmagazine.com.